On to our next speaker who uh, is from Yale. This is uh, Smita Krishnaswamy, who's a really excellent uh, assistant professor in the Department of Genetics. She's been had her lab for a few years and has really uh, uh, set the world on fire to some extent with the, the, uh, the types of approaches that she's using to understand tumor biology and cancer immunology. Uh, she both develops them and she, and she um, uh, uses them uh, and, and applies them. But I think one of the things that really stands out beyond her, her, intel or her scientific exploits is really how well she, how good she is at, at communicating some extremely complicated things for, for those of us uh, biologists uh, who don't quite understand all this. So I'm really, it's really a pleasure to, to introduce uh, Samita to talk with us. All right. um, thank, you, Nick. thank you, Nick, for the flattering introduction. Uh, now I'm on the spot. I really have to explain it well. Um, so uh, as Nick mentioned, how do I just click on it? Right there? Oh, there. Sorry, I meant to do that. Okay. So um, as Nick mentioned, I'm uh, primarily a computational biologist, uh, and I've been developing um, a lot of methods in my lab designed to tackle the types of high-dimensional, high-throughput and now also multi-sample, multi-patient data that's being um, produced in immunology and immuno-oncology. Um, and when I asked Nick sort of what sort of talk I should give, he said it would be fine if you told them a lot about your methods because we only have 20 minutes. So today I'll primarily focus on my methods and perhaps convincing you to use it in your research. Um, although we do generate some interesting data sets and uh, I can talk to you offline about those. Um, so. My talk is going to be based sort of kind of what I've done since I started my lab here at Yale. So something really exciting happened just before I came to Yale is um, I found uh, this group in the applied math department with Rafi Koifman uh, and some of his students who really um, led me into the world of manifold learning. And manifold learning has carried me in many ways. Uh, it keeps growing and evolving uh, in a way that has allowed me to tackle several problems in high dimensional data analysis. And I'm going to kind of take you through it really quickly, uh, mentioning some of the tools that could be of use in your research, coming to the problems we're working on now, which are maybe slightly more advanced than the ones we were working on three years ago when I started my lab. Um, so this is an advance. Okay. So um, as I mentioned, um, my lab tries to pick out patterns uh, completely unsupervised from high dimensional, high throughput, and heterogeneous data. So a lot of it can be single cell data. Uh, sometimes it can be patient data, such as um, gut microbiome. Um, but the common feature of the data is there's a lot of it. Um, people often aren't sure what to do with the data or what the data says. Um, so there may not even be clear hypotheses. But what my lab focuses on is detecting patterns and perhaps generating some hypotheses from this kind of data. Um, so when you have um, high throughput, high dimensional data, you can think single cell RNA sequencing data, or in this particular case, CYTOF data, as these plots are showing, uh, the challenges are, are fairly similar. Uh, sometimes I say it's all, it's all some kind of matrix to us, but what's common about these matrices is that um, there's a lot of sparsity. So the data is high dimensional, high throughput, but a lot, of, a lot of it could be missing or incorrect. There's a lot of noise due to measurement and also due to things that are happening in biology, like bursting in RNA sequencing that you might not be interested in. Uh, there's a lot of nonlinearity, so a lot of standard linear methods may not elucidate the right type of biology you want. And nowadays, scale is a huge problem. A lot of the, my talk today will be um, focused on how neural networks can help you get around that. And the main challenge sort of is how do we look at such high dimensional large data sets and understand what they're really saying to us, uh, because we have the technology. Um, and this is where I think manifolds really help uh, rescue you from a lot of seeming complexity. Uh, the assumption when you talk about a manifold is that your data actually has a shape and you can learn that shape and that shape is intrinsically low dimensional. So if the intrinsic shape of the data is low dimensional, then why does it seem like it's high dimensional? It's because the structure of the data is high dimensional, but uh, is low dimensional, but the measurement space can be high dimensional. You could be measuring 20,000 or 30,000 genes, um, 
and you're, you could have a lot of cells spread around, uh, also due to noise. Uh, but this ambient measurement space is not the same as the intrinsic space that the data lies in. Uh, that's because your cells are, are a coherent system in your body. They're acting together. And also within the cells, the transcripts and the genes and proteins are coordinating to uh, form intelligent outcomes. So there's many genes of redundancy in your cell. Uh, uh, many genes in your cell, but there's a high degree of redundancy. And what this does is it constrains the shape and types of cells. So the shapes and types of cells can be constrained to a smoother, lower dimensional shape, which you can learn. And this is a lot more tractable than looking at all those dimensions. And, um, and as we went along, we discovered that there's actually two main ways that we can use to learn this, and I'll be covering a little bit of both today. Uh, the first way is graph signal processing. It's to model the data as a graph and have walks through the graph tell you the shape of the data. And the second one is just to let a neural network do it. But you have to trick the neural network into doing the right thing and not sort of memorizing or overfitting to the data. Um, so you might just be wondering, um, why should um, the cellular state space lie in this type of clean data shape? It's often because there is some sort of progression in your data. So in the cancer system that we've studied uh, quite a bit, the epithelial to mesenchymal tran uh, transition system, it's fairly easy to describe that there's um, a transition from the epithelial to the mesenchymal state. There are phases all in between. Uh, re a recent paper we published about a tool called MAGIC showed that we could pick out as many as 10 to 11 distinct intermediate states. And cells are smoothly transitioning through this to some extent. And so if you measure a population of cells, you'll get cells in all the phases of this state space. And that's, to some extent, why you have a smooth state space. So if we sort of trust this manifold assumption will at least give us a successful model to some extent, even if it's uh, not somehow some inner ultimate truth, um, then how do we learn it? Um, the main idea of how do we learn this global structure um, is to, uh, find, for each cell, find who it, who's similar to it, who its nearest neighbors are. Um, and this seems to be fairly reliable, even with a lot of dropout and noise. You can find cells that are very similar to your cell. And once you have this, you have something like a nearest neighbor graph. It could be weighted as an affinity matrix. And you basically take walks through this data in order to understand the intrinsic dimensions, the intrinsic low dimensions of your manifold. Um, and random walk on the data in this kind of data graph is often called diffusion. Um, so the main methodology here, you don't have to necessarily pay attention to the equations, is so you have your cell by gene matrix, which could be no very noisy. Uh, you identify um, nearest neighbors by calculating distances and then thresholding the distances using some kind of nonlinear function. And then uh, you have an affinity matrix. If you Markov normalize this, uh, you get a probability that every cell is every cell's neighbor. And then you can conduct this random walk basically in a clever way by uh, exponentiating this Markov matrix. Um, if you eigen decompose it, you get something called a diffusion map. And this was developed in Yale in 2006. And diffusion dimensions can be the intrinsic dimensions sort of of your data. But we often don't um, look directly at the intrinsic dimensions, but we use this back end to learn about our data space. Another way that we've learned that you can look at manifolds is through uh, neural networks. So often people think of neural networks as classifying or some kind of black box models where they're sort of automating what a human can already do or a pathologist already does really well. We use it differently. There's another kind of neural network called an autoencoder, which simply uh, has the goal of recreating its output, uh, input at the output. So just trying to pass information through but it can't quite do it, but it, because it has an informational bottleneck. And this bottleneck also learns these same kinds of intrinsic manifold dimensions as we learn. Um, so the first algorithm that we worked on uh, when I got here is an imputation algorithm called um, MAGIC. And this was done in, in conjunction with uh, my postdoc, David Van Dyke, uh, and Guy Wolf from the Applied Math Department. Um, so the main idea of magic is to use exactly the kind of process I said to take walks through the data, but pass values as you walk through this data too. So before magic, you have some kind of noisy dropped out data. And after magic, you see it's denoised and restored. 
And so what can you do after this? You can study gene interactions again. Uh, you can do archetypal analysis like we did on the EMT data and your distri population distributions are restored. And this can be used to make um, causal, causal predictions. So um, we were really excited about the ability of magic to sort of clean up and restore the data dimensions and restore a lot of kinds of the analysis. But um, one thing that we wanted to see again is now that we've addressed the some of the challenges I said in the first slide, some of the sparsity and noise, now what does the data really look like now that we've really restored it. And for this, um, we've um, used a couple of different tools. So one tool we use in our lab is mutual, mutual information to look at low dimensional relationships between molecules. Um, so we have here uh, relationships in the bone marrow and you see that after several steps of diffusion, you see which molecule is relating to which molecule. Um, and using these mutual information approaches, we were able to make um, predictions that we can validate. For example, the role of ZEB in the EMT system. Um, and so if you want to know more about magic, you can download it and try it on your data. Um, so the next way that we wanted to visualize data is not low dimensionally in biaxial or triaxial plots, but can we see the structure of all the dimensions at once together? Um, and in order to do that, we developed a visualization tool called FATE. So I think in the last presentation, um, I, you heard about TSNI. But uh, as computational biologists, we noticed that there are a lot of pernicious problems with TSNI that we wanted to solve. And here's one. If you have this artificial tree um, that you add noise to and rotate in high dimensions, you see what TSNI does. It feels free to sort of randomly shatter the data. And that's because the SNE part of TSNI stands for stochastic neighbor embeddings. So it only cares about keeping neighbors together. And we don't think that's enough because in biology we think there's more global structure. And that's what FATE is trying to emphasize. FATE's trying to emphasize that we need to see local and global structure as well as to denoise the data. And so um, FATE um, has been uh, developed with the same backend tools, I said, uh, but with a new kind of distance between the cells. And this is an information theoretic distance. So uh, we come up with a, a representation of cells based on their nearest neighbor probabilities. And now each cell is a probability. And uh, we theorize that if you have two probability distribution, then you take an information theoretic distance as a robust distance between them. And information theoretic distances tend to be sensitive to local and global dimensions. This is the main innovation in FATE. And we used FATE to study another developmental system. And this one's a healthy one, but I think it'll apply to cancer development. We studied embryoid body differentiation in conjunction with a Yale stem cell center. And here you have um, embryonic, human embryonic stem cells growing as embryoid bodies into several different lineages. And if you grow them into several different lineages, you see the time structure goes from red to blue. Those are subsequent days in a 27-day time course. Um, so one thing you'll see is that PCA, which is sort of an older method of visualization, keeps sort of the global structure, but it um, smears the local structure. But it's still keeping the red cells, which are uh, embryonic undifferentiated stem cells, sort of far from the lineages that we're getting in the blue, which can be cardiac and neural lineages. TSNI does not keep this, and this is what we think is so bad about TSNI, is it's putting the red all over the place. Um, and so diffusion maps are an older method but, uh, that I described, but each dimension in a diffusion map has a different trajectory. But um, by contrast, in FATE, uh, we see that we're able to see the different lineages um, as, they, as they emerge. And so FATE is another tool that I'd encourage you to use and also download uh, from our lab. Um, so since after we developed MAGIC and FATE, uh, we started encountering a new problem. So now for a particular data set, we know how to denoise it, we can visualize it, we can understand the visualization to some extent. But now what we started to get was, was not one data set, but many data sets in the same experiment. And in fact, the uh, U19-HIPC consortium here at Yale gave us 180 data sets as part of a study on dengue uh, in the immune system. So what do we do with 180? Can do we run these tools 180 times and look through them? Um, of course not, we're, we're, if nothing else, too lazy to do this. Um, so, um, 
And at the same time, my collaborator, Bryn Bodermiller in Zurich, gave me a data set that had single cell data, but with 300 different drug perturbations, all done in single cell. Again, the same problem. So if you have cells under different perturbation conditions, um, you might, you'll have a mix of cell populations, and you might not be able to tell what's going on in what condition. Uh, the effect size could be small relative to technical noise. And if you have a multi, if you have multi-patient studies, like I was saying, you're collecting all these different samples. Um, now, you, what you actually want to know is about the patients. You want to know what, what's different about the patients and what's going to be the resultant um, diagnosis or prediction you'd make on the patient. So the cells are just a way of getting to the patients, but there's a lot, a lot of cells. In this data set, there were 20 million of them. Um, so the challenge just could be uh, integrating the data between the different uh, people, summarizing the data somehow, uh, dealing with batch effects. And this plot is real, batch one and batch two really separated like that. Um, in, in our plot when we looked at data, this 1 in 180 file data. So in order to deal with some of these challenges, we turn to neural networks, which are sort of industrial strength and their ability to scale. You can have a whole uh, cluster of GPUs speeding them up pretty easily. Um, so this tool we call Saucy, we just, we just submitted it to Nature Method, so uh, we're, we're feeling pretty happy ab about it at this stage, but we haven't gotten the reviews back. Um, so it stands for an autoencoder, which I told you before, but this autoencoder does a lot of the single cell analysis tasks that I already talked about, including clustering and data summarization. Um, and um, so the main idea is to let the neural network find the emergent patterns in the data and normalize between samples and multi-patient data. So the idea here is we collect data from all these different uh, patients. Uh, we have single cell data. Uh, we put the data all through Saucy um, in, in one go, um, and in, with, given that they were um, uh, acquired from different patients. And Saucy has, is a deep neural network. It has many layers. The many layers of Saucy can do a lot of the tasks that I just said. So it can denoise data in the output layer because uh, neural networks through their dimensionality reduction denoise data. It can normalize batch data. Uh, we can cluster data automatically. And also it gives you dimensionality reduced visualization if you, or trajectories if, if you need them. And then finally, using the cell, um, using the summarizations that you get from the neural network, such as the cell cluster proportions, you can stratify the patients. Um, so the main idea here is that the neural network uh, is deep and that different layers are constrained or regularized in, in different ways uh, in order to be able to perform these tasks. So the visualization layer is 2D, but it has a penalty for not uh, visualizing or aligning patients on top of each other. Uh, so unless it's really needed for the reconstruction error to preserve information, it'll align, it, it'll align the spurious dimensions over each other. The clustering layer has a kind of penalty that I might talk about uh, for a minute that gives you binarized clusters from this sort of analog data. And the reconstruction or denoising is almost free. The, uh, the upper layer of the neural network produces uh, noise-free data. Um, so the clustering representation basically says, if we have a group of cells, we want them to have very similar values in one of the layers in, in a discrete sense. So something like 1, 1, 1 for this cluster, 0, 1, 1 for this cluster. So this is kind of binarized values for continuous input data. Um, and so what we did here is we penalized something we call activation entropy. So we don't want all the nodes to be activated to the same level. We want some nodes activated very high and others very low. And there's a measure in information theory called entropy. So we regularized our neural network to have low entropy in activations. And when we do that, we get exactly the behavior we want. We get lows and highs and mu not much in the middle. You just cut it, you get the binarization you need. Um, and so finally, the one that we actually use the most, and this has been used um, in data also in the Yale um, Cancer Center trials um, that um, S Susan Kesh, uh, our collaborator, has been working with us on, which is batch normalization. Patient to patient, there can be huge batch differences because of when they're measured, when they're coming in. So the penalty we have here is a probability distribution penalty. We penalize the low dimensional probability distributions in the embedding layers for not aligning on top of each other. 
but it's not incentivized to just scramble them to align because it loses all the other structure and the other penalties we've given it, um, in particularly the reconstruction penalty. So after this penalty, you see that the samples align, and moreover, that they're now clustered by cell type rather than patients. And now the clusters actually have meaning, so you can com compare patients apples to apples. So all the cells align, they're merged well. Now if you cluster that space, you can just have cluster signatures. And so we see that the cellular manifolds look like this, um, and you see here in the dengue study, the acute patients uh, have a manifold that looks altered from the healthy, and the convalescent, hopefully, are moving back towards the healthy in terms of their entire cell populations. Um, but when we cluster these cellular manifolds, um, they're all integrated. You don't see separation between the different patients. So now you can cluster them, and our clustering gives actually very interesting results. Um, that we developed in conjunction with Ruth Montgomery here, here at Yale. Um, here it's showing the clustering of the T cells, and we see some emergence of very interesting gamma delta T cell populations that we don't see very much, but have been recorded in other infectious diseases as a marker of acute infection, which could be useful for, for example, where our patients are from in India to diagnose um, these conditions. So then each patient type um, gets a cluster signature based on these clusters, and then we're able to stratify the patients themselves. So now here's an embedding, and this visualization's on the patients. So we're done with the cells, we summarize the cells into patient clusters, now we have the patients, and we're able to directly compare the patients. And you can see what the patient manifold in, in dengue looks like. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about coming up with patient manifolds. But SASE, again, uh, our neural network, it doesn't require any external algorithms to run. You just put all your data through SASE. Um, and there's some binarization or minor post-processing that you need to do. And you see that we compared it against clustering methods, visualization methods, imputation methods, and many other methods. And you see that the only thing that's really faster than SASE uh, is randomized PCA, which means projecting to random dimensions. Um, so we encourage you to use SASE if you have the scale of data. Um, and the final technique that I'm going to talk about is fairly new, and I'll just take a minute to talk about it, was this idea of embedding patients. Not only do cells lie in manifolds, but so do patients. And the main idea here is a tool called FEMD, is we derive a distance between experimental samples or patients based on their cellular populations, which will allow you to get a picture of patients and not cells, if you start with cells. Um, and this is all based on something called earth movers distance. So that's why I showed an earth mover vehicle. It's, it's uh, motivated by moving dirt from here to there. So if you're computational, you think about all kinds of things, cells, dirt, um, whatever it requires. So the main setup here was our other data set, which was huge, which we got 300 drug perturbations on top of single cell uh, PI2T breast cancer cells. Um, and here, the each well, uh, it was a 60-well multiplexing barcoded plate run through Cytoff. Um, and you know, there were several antibodies measured on all these patients. Um, and uh, sorry, it says HMLA, but it's PI2T. I do know that. Um, <laughs> and the overview of the algorithm is simply that first you break the cells into cell types. And we derive this kind of a cell type tree. And now what you do is you calculate the amount of effort it would take, for example, an earth mover vehicle to move cells from one distribution of populations to the other. And what is the amount of effort proportional to? Well, we really don't know. It's some kind of biological evolutionary effort, but we think it has something to do with the tree distance on this kind of embedding that we get. And we get good results when, when we assume that. And this kind of earth mover distance can be used as the kind of distance I showed you in the beginning, just to embed with fate, for example. Um, so the ground distance here, or the distance taken to move dirt, comes from this cell manifold. In the cell manifold, we see that in this tree, CD, in this example tree, CD4 cells are very far from CD8 cells. So if a, some patients, have, if you're looking for the difference between patients, the difference is going all the way from CD4 to CD8. It's taking a lot of effort to move, but if it's from one type of CD4 to another, it might take less effort to move. And this is quantified by the earth mover distance. And once we had that, a lot of our drug perturbation data looked a lot more understandable. All of our drugs, actually, the perturbation manifold itself is quite low dimensional. It's about two dimensional here. And we see very coherent 
groups of kinase inhibitors, which, we which is what we tested. And actually, we found that the Aurora kinase inhibitors have some very interesting effects that we're um, now hoping to do a follow-up on. But what does it help you to do this kind of embedding? There, there are several. The first is if you haven't measured something and you, you have some idea of the affinity to the other inhibitors, you can predict the single cell data or vice versa. If you have some single cell data, you can tell how it relates to the drugs that you have here. And so we validated that we can use a completely different kind of data set to come up with affinities and then insert a new drug into this population and predict its effects. So, um, so this is a summary of so we're sort of where we went and where we're going now. So initially, we started out cleaning up cells, visualizing cells. Then when we had single data sets sort of well analyzed, we started analyzing many, many data sets. Um, so this is, I think, the future of immuno-oncology is generating many single cell data sets. Uh, for example, I know at the Yale Cancer Center, there's an immunotherapy trial going on where patients are either sequenced or their blood is uh, measured through CYTOF every week after immunotherapy, and then after radiation therapy, and then after both. And so I think that these tools will hopefully be useful as, as, as we go along. Um, so the main conclusion was that manifold learning has helped us at many different levels. Uh, manifold alignment can help correct batch effect between different patients, and that these can be learned um, scalably by neural networks. Um, and if you're looking, and um, I have to thank people in my lab, they're all absolutely brilliant. Um, postdocs, David, Kevin, who's actually now a professor, grad students, um, Scott, medical student Will, Dan, um, Jay, um, associate researcher Guy Wolf, also soon to be professor. Um, and if you want any of our software, it's all at our GitHub. And um, most of what I've talked about is already on BioArchive. So you can take a look at our papers and, and send us comments. Um, let me know if you have any questions. And I'm looking for more new postdocs. <laughs>